This is Lindy's Diner. As you might have gathered from the video and from whatever remains intact of my youth, I did not start Lindy's Diner. Lindy's Diner was started by a guy named Leo Lindy Lindemann. And Lindy's became famous worldwide for serving cheesecake. The sad thing is that Lindy's closed last year. And a lot of my speech is going to be about a place that's gone out of business. But the good news is, the really happy thing, the amazing thing about Lindy's is that it only went out of business after 97 years of serving the folks passing through and living in midtown Manhattan. And I find that inspiring. I find it inspiring to think about creating something that really without reinvention or repositioning or reincarnation serves people for very close to a century. The reason to talk about Lindy's is because it is the namesake of what's called the Lindy Effect. You see, Lindy's was, at a certain time, the hotspot for New York's most famous entertainers to hang out. It's where Milton Berle said he had dinner every night, and what Harpo Marx called his home away from home. The Broadway musical Guys and Dolls has a song that mentions the cheesecake specifically. And so it was a hub of gossip in the entertainment world of New York. And if you think about it, Entertainment careers make for great gossip because they're so fickle. They're up and down. People come onto the scene out of nowhere. Overnight, they become a success. Then they're a superstar. Then they fade away. Then they have a big comeback, and it all repeats again. And it gives a lot to talk about, in part because it all seems so random. But actually, this guy, this French mathematician in the mid-1980s, did some research. He started looking into entertainment careers. And and he actually found a pattern, and this is what he found. He proved statistically that the longer your entertainment career has been around, the longer it was likely to be around in the future. That if you were famous 20 years ago, you were probably still going to be famous 20 years from now. Said otherwise, he proved statistically that you and I, a decade from now, will still be watching Meryl Streep star in films, and Timothy Chalamet's moment has probably already passed, I'm sad to say. Mandelbrot called this the Lindy Effect because, of course, of the entertainers who were at Lindy's Diner hanging out, who created the data for his research, but also because he extended the concept and the principle. And Lindy's, the diner itself, demonstrated the effect that the longer something has been in existence, the longer it will continue to be in existence. My company, Getaway, designs tiny cabins, places them in the woods, and rents them out by the night to folks looking to disconnect and recharge. We don't sell any cheesecake, I'm sad to report. But we do think about the Lindy effect a lot. We think about it because unlike the startups I did prior to Getaway, which indoctrinated me with the view that the best thing to spend your time on, the most fulfilling thing to spend your time on, the place you will find the most success is the newest thing. In those prior companies, it was all about the latest and greatest, where at Getaway, we actually don't think that much about what's new. We think about what's old. We think about the Lindy effect, and we look back to what was loved 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, or 100 years ago. And we try to incorporate those things into the products and services and experiences we create, because we think that's how we'll have a shot at creating something that lasts 10 or 20 or 100 years into the future. Now, of course, there's a lot of things that are old to gain inspiration from. We go very far back. We say, what are the things that are actually core to the human experience that we can build into what we're doing? And so we think about things that are almost as old as time. We think about conversation. We think about sleep. We think about creativity. We think about reflection. And you might, at this point, be thinking, this guy, John, is a hypocrite. He's based his whole business on a new trend of the last few years, the trend of tiny houses. And if we were doing this a couple of years ago, I would have said, you're absolutely right. I was, and I guess I am, a tiny house fanatic. I followed all the Instagram accounts about tiny houses. I downloaded blueprints. I sketched my own designs. Eventually, I created a team and formed a company and a pilot around the idea of tiny houses. And the team designed, you know, we designed our own house, and we put it on a piece of land. And then we wrote a press release. And at the top of the press release, we wrote, you can test drive a tiny house. 
And the thing is that that actually worked. That press release led to a lot of press, and a lot of our early customers, hundreds of them, thousands of them, to whom we're grateful. And they were like us. They followed the same Instagram accounts, and they watched all of the tiny house shows on HGTV, and life was good. We were sold out. And a big part of me said, this is great. We're going to be the tiny house company. But another part of me worried about it. Another part of me said, something doesn't feel right here, that if we're building our company around the idea of test driving something, that's not going to last very long. And so the team and I sat down, and we, we remembered the Lindy effect. And we thought about, what are the deeper things going on in what we're doing? What are the simpler things? What are the longer lasting ideas that are present in this, in this project we've come up with? And really, we ended up with three. The first one was the idea of disconnection, that throughout human history, us humans have actually had a lot of time to sit and think and sort out our thoughts, and sort out our feelings, and that in a world that's becoming ever more connected, ever more overwhelming, ever crazier, that that is something worth building into our future. That is something that we need to make sure we carve out if we're going to hang on to our sense of humanity. The second theme that we settled on was the idea of spending time in nature, something clearly as old as time, uh, but something that as you and I and our families and friends move more and more into cities as globalization happens. The desire to return to the wild is stronger. And the third theme that emer emerged was the theme of leisure, which is something I feel is not optional. It's not a nice to have. It's not a want. It's required that we carve out time that is not spent chasing productivity or trying to achieve the next achievement, but instead spent resting or thinking or letting our minds wander, or frankly, even being bored. And as we thought about these three themes, we didn't do it alone. We did it with our guests, who have been instrumental in how we've built the business. And our guests, we noticed, were saying, yes, I came here to test drive a tiny house, but it did a lot more than that for me. And they said these things that I don't think many people say to a hospitality company or a hotel company. They said things like, I really valued being able to sit in silence. Or I was able to have that conversation with my husband or my wife or my boyfriend or my girlfriend that we didn't even know we needed to have. But we sat down at Getaway, and we were able to have that conversation. And as we went through this process, I realized that this is actually what I was obsessing over years earlier when I was obsessing about tiny houses. It was never really about the clever storage cubbies or the cozy, Instagrammable designs of the houses. It was about, boy, if I had one of these things, or I had access to one of these things, I could spend some time disconnected in nature, taking a break. And so all this led us to double down on those three themes. And so we rejected the pressure our investors put on us to put Wi-Fi in our cabins. Today, Getaway has no Wi-Fi in any cabin. You lock up your cell phone, thank you. Yay, down with Wi-Fi. Um, we have no Wi-Fi in any of our cabins. And we did that because we knew that adding it might broaden our appeal a little bit, or at least so our investors thought. But it would critically disrupt from the rejuvenation that comes from being truly disconnected. On nature, we, we, in, we came up with a big getaway window. And in fact, it's gotten only bigger over time. And we placed it above the bed so that at Getaway, you fall asleep and you wake up under the trees, immersed in the outdoors. And the most important thing I think we did was we centered the experience on the campfire, perhaps the best possible example of the Lindy effect, one of humans' very first inventions, and still the one that I think is best for allowing us to relate to one another. And the good news is that all this deepening really worked, that early positive feedback which was maybe a trickle became a flood. Today, we get about 65% of our guests right back to us, and they tell us their stories, and they give us their feedback. And it's really, fortunately, positive and, and, and more importantly, meaningful what they tell us. Our NPS scores were hovering around 80. They're now 90, all because of this deepening. And so our kind of 
you know, and, and this is some of the additional feedback where people were saying things like, I was transported back to childhood. With no offense, I don't know if people say this to Marriott. I don't know if when they go stay in a standard hotel room, they say, you transported me back to childhood, to a time and a place before email notifications, before a barrage of deadlines, and before the constant tug of I should be doing this or I should be doing that. And so our one cabin turned into three. Our one location is now turned into eight. And this summer, we'll launch our 280th tiny cabin in the woods. And our mission ultimately is to be outside of every place that has an always-on culture where people are stressed out, where people would benefit from pulling a ripcord and ending up two hours away from where, whatever their daily routine was, sitting next to a campfire or inside a beautiful tiny house and breathing at least a moment, a moment's sigh of relief. And as I move towards wrapping this up, I want to make a couple important clarifications. I don't think we should reject new ideas. I think new ideas are great. They make us innovative. They keep us energized. They drive us forward. They inspire us. But what I try to do and what I would invite all of you to do if you're not doing it already is at that moment when you get really excited about a new idea or a new technology, dig underneath it and try to see if there's something deeper there, something older there that's fueling this thing. And I think if we use those things, those deeper things, to inform our products and our services and our companies and our organizations, that we will avoid chasing fads and chasing trends that might be big this year but are likely to be gone next year. Secondly, I don't think we should reject new technology or new amenities. I just think we need to make sure we use them to serve the deeper thing as opposed to distract from it. We know too well by now that the latest and greatest technology can sometimes be a good servant, but almost never be a good master. And by the way, as an aside on tech, Getaway uses a lot of tech. All of our bookings come through a website we've built. We text people about their stays. We've built our own lock hardware and software to allow guests to come and go. But the thing is that when, when these guests write back to us about their experiences with their stories, I don't think one of them has ever said, boy, you have really great lock software. We really enjoyed that. Um, they do, however, say stuff like, I really appreciated that I could come and go as I pleased, that I didn't have to stop at a check-in desk and make small talk with somebody, that my time at Getaway was really my own. And as we hear about people who come back to get away again and again, it's, it's that that makes me proudest. It's when they write to us, they, they actually don't talk very much about the cabin design, which we hope they like, or the way we lay out the properties. They talk about themselves. They talk about what they did. They talk about, I actually got to play cards with my daughter. Um, or I got to have that conversation with my, my husband or my wife. We got to sort something out while we were at Getaway. Or I had a new idea or I decided to quit my job. I was able to cook. I had the energy to write or the time to read or had a new idea or was able to process some grief. And so that's what fuels us, and that's what's going to drive us forward to keep growing this company. Um, and as we do so, I'll admit that I don't know if tiny houses are going to be a big thing in 10 years or 25 years. But I do think that in 10 or 25 years, people will want to disconnect. People will want to spend time in nature. And people will really value leisure. And that's my hope for Getaway. And that's my hope for all of us, actually, is that we have the privilege to spend our time and our energy and our effort working on those deeper things, those simpler things, those more meaningful things that the Lindy effect tells us are likely to last longer into the future. And as we keep doing this, we're going to keep in mind Lindy's Diner and that cheesecake. But we're going to remind ourselves that that cheesecake isn't the reason that Lindy's lasted for 97 years. It may be the reason people came in the door the first time, but it was the conversation and the camaraderie and the connection that kept them coming back. Thank you very much.